Hi, this is Charles Hoskinson broadcasting live from warm, sunny Colorado. Always warm, always sunny. Sometimes Colorado. Today is Sunday, 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 October 8th, 2023. And it is time for yet another one of the impromptu, always fun, always exciting surprise AMAs in the office today to do some work on the Constitution, amongst many, many other things. And I figured, you know, I've done an AMA in a long time, not by uh, not by choice. It's just been busy, you know. A lot been going on. Things are things are happening, and it uh, would be good to go and see what's going on with you guys. See what your questions are. It's a very very loaded time in Cardano. There's lots going on. You know, we had NFT XLV. Uh, we had uh, Rare Evo. There's obviously a lot of workshops going on. Uh, we're right in the thick of things with uh, Sancho Net. I think we're at version 8.5, uh, and uh, we're getting pretty close to full implementation of the SIP, meaning that from a feature perspective, uh, things in the SIP you actually can do through the command line. Uh, it'll be a little while more, you know, a few more releases before I think we get there, and then at that point it's productization, meaning that it actually have to do integration and testing and QA and all those types of things. However, that means SoundJournet uh, has fully realized and people can begin messing with it and playing with it and having a lot of fun with it. So we're uh, we're kind of moving along and uh, getting those things done. 2024 is really looking from an I.O. perspective to be the year of sidechains and Mithril. You know, those are the two big things I would love to see get done. Uh, you know, from a research perspective and a thread, there's Ouroboros Leos and input endorsers, and we worked real hard last year uh, to get some of the foundations of input endorsers to the directionality of the research. Uh, and this year, we've been kind of tightening the bolts and really figuring out exactly how we want to do it. And I think what will happen is once that's been completely set up, uh, then well-typed or some firm like that will go into heavy modeling and analysis mode, and that'll be a concurrent thread that runs with all of the stuff required for the plumbing of sidechains. And boy, is there a lot of plumbing that needs to put it, be put in for sidechains. And then, of course, there's a third thread that never stops. There's multiple threads. It's like we're weavers here. That third thread that uh, never stops is um, improvements to Plutus and the development experience. Uh, we're starting to fall in love with Aiken a little bit. Hydra team actually prototyped some uh, of the Hydra stuff with Aiken and did a cross comparison to uh, Plutus script. And there's some good things there. It's a great ecosystem. It really shows you the power when the community comes together, and comes up with a good idea. And, you know, you have to be very pragmatic about these things. And then many other threads, you know, threads like how to get Mithril into the node itself, um, improvements to the network stack. Peer to peer is already here, people are using it. Uh, and obviously the, that rollout comes over time. It's fully realized with Genesis. Genesis is already underway. Uh, there's a fixed cost contract out to tweak about it. So people are uh, chipping away at things and hopefully the first half of next year, we'll see that if um, they keep the deadlines. So, you know, just a lot of stuff, uh, you know, and very happy with, uh, with the progress of things. Uh, it's, New development paradigm can't be everything, everybody, and, you know, completely new network. No one's ever seen these types of things before. Uh, yet the assumptions we made in the lab are coming true in reality. For example, many of you saw the tweet about Mithril 20-minute bootstrap time for a full node. 20 minutes. And this is Mithril version 1. Mithril version 2 is almost done. Leo Raisin from Boston University came over to Edinburgh for a semester and worked with our guys. He did the compact certificate paper with Algorand, really great top-notch researcher. So he came on over, worked with our guys, and took a lot of great ideas in that ecosystem and brought them over and merged them with ideas in ours. It was a nice bridge between those two. Uh, so I think we're getting down to the bedrock about what can be achieved with certificates like that. A lot of work on Pluto Eris as well. Super excited about the direction of that. So it's hard to fire on you know, five, six different threads of research at the same time, but I'm pretty impressed with how the team's been approaching that. And still a few more announcements for the end of the year. You know, when you look at uh, Minotaur and, you know, when you look at uh, side chains and these things, I think people would be very, very happy about that. Plus, I guess I have a Twitter space tomorrow with Iran on midnight. And I think people will be very happy about midnight as well. Um, you know, on the commercial side, 
on our side, IO, you know, we have ventures like RealFi Co. Uh, that's John O'Connor's company. He was director of African operations for a long time. And he did deals like the Ethiopia MOE deal, which, by the way, is still going on. It's still a thing. I love people say it's been canceled or it's a lie. It's like that's still a thing. And it kept and survived through two separate ministers of education and a war and other things like that. And there's actually a whole team uh, that works on it. They're part of our PI process. Uh, and they uh, integrate quite well with the PRISM team. We deployed it on the old PRISM 1.4. Uh, and uh, when the PRISM framework upgrades a little bit, a later version of uh, 2X, 2.x will uh, be the uh, rollover to that. Um, it remains to be seen how to scale that because there's a lot of problems uh, in many different dimensions on how one would scale that across the entire economy. And if it's even a wise idea to do that, um, but you know, it's still underway. Uh, so John led that effort. He led the effort with many different African jurisdictions, which were extremely crypto curious in 2021 when Bitcoin was $68,000, uh, and not so much after FTX, that whole well dried up. However, the people of Africa never lost their passion In Nigeria, more than 20% of people own or know somebody who owns uh, a cryptocurrency. That's a country of 200 million people. Think about that, according to data from uh, some big consultancy like Gartner or McKinsey or something like that. Uh, you'll have to find that source, but it's very vibrant. And you'll see it anecdotally when you see the events in Nigeria, like a lot of people show up. And it's actually the same Kenya and many other places. And so Real FICO is based in Kenya. Uh, and John's been putting it together. And that's where a lot of the ideas we've had about microfinance and remittances are coming together. Uh, Denal Patel, the former chief product officer of Input Outputs, now working over at uh, RealFi Co. with uh, with John. They're both founding and building up that company alongside a lot of uh, people that were responsible for these pilot projects that we did. And the rubber meets the road where you actually have direct consumer adoption. And there's a lot of cool things there. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's ebbs and flows into how much you can get done at any given time. And actually, technology tends to be the least limiting factor tends to be the macro cycle. Uh, so corporate procurement goes to hell when a recession happens for new technologies. And when the U.S. government's trying to kill that technology, it doubly so. So you actually have to pivot from a B2B or B2G strategy to a B2C strategy and go direct to the consumer. Because there, there's always a demand signal if there's a good product. And then once you have a large customer base, you can work your way back to B2B and B2G. Just how that works. Uh, but I'm pretty comfortable, happy with it. Prism's looking good too. You know, uh, we're on quarterly release cycles with uh, the PI system that they have and backfilling a lot of little things here and there. Uh, definitely going to open court. And uh, my hope is that it can become a Hyperledger project, be right up there with Indy and the rest of the gang. There's a lot to do though. Uh, and uh, it's under great leadership under David Harding. He's a wonderful CEO and uh, he's a real smart guy. Been in the identity world for a long time. Lace is looking great too. I'm very happy with Lace and there's lots of cool announcements and things. And it's one product that I do get involved in from time to time personally with Mike Ward and Tyan uh, and uh, the product team there. Because uh, I like the fact that we have a monthly release cadence and I like the fact that we can really start getting to unfinished business. Like right now we have multi-delegation. We got to get delegation portfolios in. But also I'd like to see hardware multi-sig, a paper wallet generator, yeah, just YubiKey integration, just tons of little things. And so we're going to really master that. And, you know, it's nice because it allowed us to have great conversations about SIP30, SIP95, um, great conversations uh, about how one would build a DAP store. And we had some phenomenal ideas there that will work their way through. Uh, and But it makes us care a lot more because we're on the receiving end of the technology, just like Hydra makes us care a lot about the DAP side of things because we have to use the tools we build to implement Hydra. If they don't work as well as we'd hope, then we're like, yeah, uh, we need to make some improvements there. So overall, I kind of enjoy uh, uh, the pace of that. And I'm an aggressive guy, so I'll, I'll push harder to speed it up a bit. But I do want Lace to be the standard for the industry, not just for Cardano, but for the industry on a good wallet experience that is safe and effective uh, with premium features and freemium features and these types of things. And so 2024 is going to be a good year for that. And it's a good team. And I really admire them for uh, their ability to kind of push through and get something launched. It's always scary when you launch a product. 
uh, it's not scary, Gary, but you know, scary when you launch a product and actually get it in the market, have customers have feedback and they yell at you and say, Hey, you're not as smart as you think you are. It's like, yeah, that's true. There are uh, a lot of uh, things on social media right now. There's a groundswell of, of some exceedingly loud, but very small minority of people in the Cardano community uh, who of course, Whenever they don't like the way things go, they just go and say things like people dumped or, you know, uh, IO controls the network unilaterally or, you know, a whole bunch of these types of things. And, you know, that's on them. Um, there's only so much time and oxygen in life. And at some point, you just got to throw in the towel and just let them burn themselves out and flame out. In general, I blame the times and I blame uh, social media for our inability to have conversations with each other. You see, uh, it, in any healthy rivalry or disagreement, there's always a little jabbing that occurs. Yeah, so if you like football and a person's a Broncos fan, we have a legendary rivalry with the Oakland Raiders and the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Diego Chargers. Why? Because we're all in the same division and we all fight each other multiple times per year. And uh, sometimes the Broncos win, sometimes they don't. Now, if you're a Kansas City fan and, uh, you know, I'm a Broncos fan, you know, we always uh, you know, have a little fun jabbing each other every Sunday uh, when those games come in. Um, well, that doesn't mean we hate each other and that doesn't mean we don't actually work together and communicate with each other. And uh, most of the things that uh, reasonable people do through Twitter and social media uh, when they they say ah Ethereum's this or Cardano's this or Solana's this, like the Nintendo cartridge with Solana, for example, it's in that lens, you know. And it's it, the point of it is just to, just to kind of drum up a little of those feelings. Um, but you'll notice something that we're all staying in the same league. We're all cryptocurrencies. We all work together. We all have the same common foes: CBDCs and central banks and totalitarian regimes, the delta between the aspirations of your average Ethereum person who really believes in Ethereum and uh, the average Cardano person who really believes in Cardano is not very big. You're both using public key cryptography, both using wallets, you're both using a cryptocurrency, which makes you a very small minority of the world population at the moment. Yet, uh, unfortunately, there is this uncanny valley where even though people are 98% alike and aligned, that 2% delta actually ends up creating more tribalism than people imagine. And this is amplified by social media where people think it's okay uh, to say things like people are evil, people are dishonest, people lack integrity. And it's also okay to just lie and omit huge amounts of history. For example, the Genesis Keys uh, it's no thing that's hidden. It's like all there. Three entities is three, two, two, IOG, um, Emergo, and CF. And there's an entire off chain governance structure and on chain implicit governance structure about how those are used. For example, we don't do hard forks until 70% of the SPOs upgrade. That precedent hasn't been violated and it's there. And there's all this stuff that happens behind the scenes off chain to basically keep those keys secure. And, and they're used in very deliberate and considered way with a lot of latency. It takes months to coordinate uh, even minor upgrades at the moment. Now, those keys are hard coded into the Cardano Genesis block and have been for a long time. When are they going to be replaced? Well, why do you think we've been talking about SIP 1694 since 2021? You know, this concept of let's upgrade the governance stack of Cardano. And uh, even before there was a SIP 1694, there were discussions about elements and fundamental criteria that would have to go in. The Genesis Keys, for example, deprecate them. And that concept replaced with a notion of constitutional committee. You go from static and hard-coded to dynamic and voted on with a quorum that can be expanded. It's an M of N with fixed terms. And then also allow Plutus scripts to be used in it. So you can have multiple parties control one of those keys as opposed to a single organization, for example. 
and all kinds of bespoke governance structures and also beholden them to an on-chain uh, constitution for a variety of guardrails that one would want to put in the system and then go from a unicameral to a tricameral model, adding DRAPs and stake pool operators formally into the governance process. Well, this is not a new concept. We've been talking about it this year of more than 50 workshops. And SanchoNet, the entire reason of its existence is for that. And every single person on the development side of Cardano is aligned, trying very hard to test and understand uh, and build infrastructure towards that end, up to and including community projects that are trying to figure out how do we make a great experience for DRAPs or for accountability and audit and oversight. What will voting look like in practice? You know, how do how do those results get broadcast? What did, what did we learn from the Catalyst experiment? What did we learn from Polkadot's Open Gov or Tezos's four stage governance process? These types of things. So it's insanely disingenuous then to go ahead and say the goal of this entire endeavor is to preserve and protect the very thing the endeavor is trying to replace and remove. Why would you do it? Why would you go and say these things? When all the evidence is in that direction, millions, actually tens of millions of dollars at this point of development effort, scientific effort have been spent and the entire desire is to do that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why people do that. I don't know why they, they feel emboldened for these types of things, but they do. Um, you know, uh, and that's just the nature of discourse today on the internet. And generative AI is only going to make it worse because people will just make stuff up and then use AI to reinforce that. And then people just choose to believe what they want to believe. We live in a world today where truth is not an objective, absolute thing. Uh, people basically invent a fantasy and then they ignore any evidence that would dissuade them from that fantasy. And they double down on anything that confirms it. And then they build a group around it. And they run through and they just absolutely have to have that group every day, reinforce it. And there's a purity test. Anybody who presents a differing idea from it gets pushed out. I see all these people say, oh, well, Charles called me a liar. Welcome to the club. Well, yeah, if you lie, I call you a liar. It's just that that's just what it is. It's objectively wrong. And they, they manipulate the narrative to try to fit into a fold where, well, of course he did that, you know, and they then say it's a cult and all these people are fine because they don't have any free will. Apparently everybody listening who likes me agrees with me. You're being manipulated, I guess, according to these people, you're all members of this. And I say, all right, well, my whole goal is to put the whole network in as many people's hands as possible and decentralize things. And we even get academic institutions to physically measure the level of decentralization because for 10 plus years, our entire industry has been claiming decentralization, but nobody bothered to put money, time, and effort into measuring it objectively. Basic concept. Even governments didn't do this when they're supposed to, and they're trying to create legislation regulation based upon it. So, we spent millions of dollars and put our money where our mouth was and founded a lab at University of Edinburgh specifically to this end that has a dedicated professor and graduate students and engineers, and it doesn't work for Cardano. It's going to start at Bitcoin and work its way down the list and measure the amount of decentralization. So there's an objective metric that nobody can argue with that basically talks about where the network is centralized and where it's decentralized. Why would a person whose objective and goal is to centralize everything and preserve and protect the cult of personality. Want to have an entity he can't control, basically give him a report card on whether he achieved that or not. Why? Why would we go through the peer review process? And when they can't explain the papers, what they do is they attack the very peer review process. They either say it's illegitimate because they're not in journals, not understanding computer science, the peer review process is done with conferences. Talk to any fucking computer scientist about it. Well, take five minutes. Go, go down and send them an email. Ask them. Don't take my word for it. Ask them. Why do they show up for these conferences? Why do people have to referee at a conference? You don't do this in physics. You do it in computer science. 
But no, the process must be wrong because there's no reasonable explanation of how we take the time to write over a seven year period, 200 papers. Is that fucking marketing? What marketing value do I get out of those papers? Can anybody read them? Can anybody understand them? We predicted all the problems Ethereum was going to run into with Casper years ago. Nobody in the media looked at it, cared about it, wrote about it. Why? Because they couldn't understand the paper. So that's certainly not marketing. And if these papers were bad papers, then why are they getting accepted at major peer review checkpoints? Why are people getting poached? Why do people get tenure? Why do people get promoted in academia? Is it just the entire space is crooked and corrupt and the, how you get promoted in computer science land is, is completely divorced from the impact of your research that you do? Is your conspiracy so strong that all of computer science now has to be aligned to, to be co-opted by the evil Charles Hoskinson? But it's a cult, according to them. Why? Because it disagrees with their worldview. And that's okay now. It just is. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's okay in a broader sense because why should we expect any different? Look at politics today. Look at the politicians today. Look at medicine today. Look at education today. Why should crypto be any different? Can't get angry about these things. Uh, we just have to accept that they are what they are and move forward. And the thing is, the more successful you become and the more you accomplish in life, the more you push forward in life, um, the more enemies you produce and the more disagreements you produce and the more anger and vitriol you produce. And then at some point, you no longer are human. You're something else. You're some straw man that people have put up or idol that people have put up to deify or to demonize and attack. And you can never have a conversation anymore. And maybe that's where we're at. But that's okay, because we predicted that too. You know, that's why SIP 1694 exists. That's why Intersect exists. That's why I keep pushing for members-based organizations and decentralization. It's real easy to attack one guy. It's a lot harder to attack a movement. So that's what we're doing as an ecosystem. That's what Satoshi did. He had the foresight to leave before that happened. And it's what Vitalik is enduring right now with his own community. It's what every single cryptocurrency community is enduring with people that give it a little bit of a push to get started is that uh, cult of destruction. And that's the nature of things. And that's why blockchains are necessary. Thinking a lot these days about what's required to write a constitution and uh, what's required to leave a legacy of, of good ideas that ought to be preserved and protected. The point of blockchain technology, the point of the industry as a whole, is to acknowledge that humans are flawed and they'll always let you down no matter who they are, myself included. No one is perfect in everything. And anyone who asserts that is certainly not perfect. So the point is that you have to introduce systems that don't lie, systems that don't have problems, systems that objectively enforce a reality upon people, even if that constructed reality is not the same as actual reality. The fact that we all play the same game and are beholden to the same rules is what makes the game fun, interesting, and useful. There's no laws of physics behind football having a touchdown, seven points, six points, and plus, you know, you get your point after. There's no laws of physics about that. Okay, but they just decided. The, you know, the whole league could get together and change to say a touchdown's 10 points instead of six points. But they don't. Why? Because all those records, the people that came before, and the social dynamics of that change would be dramatic. All right, well. Now it's seven, a point after six. Now I'm doubting myself. It's six with the after point. Yeah. Because yeah, you can do the two point conversion as well to get to eight. Yeah. So it's six and one. It's too early. <laughs> Anyway, there's no laws of physics behind that. 
Uh, but social, it's a constructed reality and it's a strong constructed reality. Blockchain takes this concept of these constructed realities and puts them on steroids, makes them super strong, grows them up, and can use that for the basis of consent, truth, money, and gives you objective metrics that you can look at about how much consent there is, how much security there is behind that constructed reality that exists. And that's a very powerful thing because we've lost the ability in this post-truth world to regulate and moderate ourselves. Look at Elon Musk. He's the greatest example of an unhinged person because somewhere along the line, I think he legitimately decided that the world is made up and we're all living in a simulation. So what he's doing is just maximizing the hilarity of things. No normal person would spend $45 billion to buy a company that has brand equity that's a decade old with 300 million people liking it and then just change the name to X and then make sex jokes about it. But he does because it's funny to him. And if you believe the world's a simulation, it makes no difference overall whether something is built to last or it's built just to humor you because it's a simulation. It can change at any given moment. Every one of your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your religious faith, your whole family is just a video game. It was all made up. So there you go. And he's just going to keep doing crazy and interesting things and pushing the bounds of things. Have 12 kids, all this stuff. He's unhinged. He's not connected to anything. There's no rules for a person like that. You can sue him. You can write tell all books about him. You can do all kinds of horrible things. Doesn't impact him. Still just as rich. And th so you need something to ground yourself and connect to, or else everybody just starts floating away in the clouds. And I'd like to believe that uh, blockchains are like that. They allow you to connect to something that doesn't have a agenda. It doesn't care. If you're from Senegal or from Colorado or from Hawaii or from Russia, it doesn't care about geopolitics. It doesn't care if it's good for you or it's bad for you. Just like the laws of physics, gravity doesn't really care who you are. It doesn't really care where you're from. You can build great things when you have that grounding. And you can build institutions that actually last a long time from that grounding. Otherwise, they float away. They're useless. It's one of the reasons why crypto exists is because we removed from the fiction of money the grounding. It used to be the gold standard. It used to be commodity monies in the history of money. Somewhere along the way, a bunch of very smart economists decided arbitrarily that it'd be better if we unhooked money from reality, from something that actually has scarcity behind it. The minute they did that, lo and behold, we now have inflation. It's turning into hyperinflation. My grandfather was a lineman when he started. He got out of the Marine Corps, served 1948 to 1952. And he got a, his first job out was a lineman. And he, on that salary, was able to have seven kids. His wife stayed at home and buy a home and two cars. You now have husband and wife, college educated, high paying tech jobs can barely afford to buy a home and can't afford to have a single kid and make a car payment. Is it because evil corporations are just taking all the money from you? No, it's because the thing we're paying you with back in 1952 was connected to something real. And the thing we pay you with in 2023 is not. And because of that, a bunch of the powerful people got together with the government, they rig the game and they get to use that remaining value first and you get the table scraps. It's a rigged game. So cryptocurrency comes along and says, well, let's create a digital scarcity and ground you in something. Okay. And lo and behold, we're the bad guys. Lo and behold, the US government has to take us down. Why? Because they can't allow an industry like this to grow and flourish because in contrast, people will start waking up and understanding how worthless money really is and how much pain and suffering that they're going through for the table scraps that they're being given. That's the power of grounding things in reality. Imagine if we did that with elections 
Imagine if we did that with property rights. Imagine if we did that with contracts, intellectual property, your data, the oil of the 21st century. Where that's where the world will go. So every tool in the book is going to be used. Uh, every technique is going to be used and people will fight things that are in their own best interest because they just don't understand. And they're so in the matrix and so propagandized and so turned into stuff that uh, makes it really hard for them to see the forest from the trees. So you just got to move forward and um, just got to keep chipping away at it. That's what we do. I've been here for 10 years, 10 years. It's a long time. Could have been a doctor in that time period. <laughs> Probably would have been happier practicing with my brother and dad. Um, but uh, it wouldn't have been as meaningful or interesting, I'll tell you that. And I'll be here for longer. I'm not going anywhere. You know, you change your techniques and you change your style and you have to know when to be in the room, when not to be in the room. But the mission is always there. And we're doing it together. We'll get this done, decentralized governance. And uh, next year, we're not going to be having these types of arguments and debates. We're going to be having a much more meaningful and significant, which is what is the budget of Cardano? The hidden truth of 1694 is immediately after ratification and adoption, the very first thing people are going to want to do is start spending the treasury. And that needs to be done in a structured way. And how every government does it, that's worth its salt, is a budget. You get a pie graph and you have to start allocating the different things. If you care a lot about brand perception, marketing, and adoption, well, do you 20% of the annual budget care? Do you 15% of the annual budget care? Do you 25%? What would you fire or give up for that? We can't do that anymore in the United States. Very easy to fix our budget. There are 5% across the board cut every year until the budget balances. That's what corporations do. Notice they can't give anything up anymore because that's how politics works. So how do we be better and not fall into the same trap? That's the fight for 2024. And that's the fight we invite by embracing decentralized governance. But the payoff is desperately needed funding gets in the hands of institutions, people, and projects, thousands of which across the world to grow and evolve Cardano and push adoption. So we'll do it. We'll get it done. Uh, but that's a much bigger, more interesting fight than uh, what happens over Twitter these days, especially in a post-truth world. Okay. Why is Catalyst still our vote solution? It is not. That's the entire point of 1694, the DREP stack, and actually uh, Cardano Ballot, among some of the other things. Hi, Charles. I feel you're ignoring the India Cardano community. Many folks here are working very hard to promote and educate Cardano. Please visit India so we get more devs on board. I am not ignoring India. It's definitely a high priority. In fact, there's many prominent Indians who've worked in the Cardano ecosystem. Manmeet Singh, for example, was chief investment officer of Emergo and tried very hard to build a good uh, set of infrastructure there. Just been difficult because the Indian government has been, always been unclear about its status with cryptocurrencies. They wake up some days and want to be China and say everything's banned. They wake up other days and they say, hey, uh, you know, we love crypto and it's great. And it's the largest remittance culture and microfinance culture in the entire world. So obviously it's the perfect place for cryptocurrency adoption. Um, so I will go to India. I probably will go in 2024. I actually had plans to go uh, during 2020. In fact, we had trip all set up and ready to go in June of 2020. Uh, and then COVID happened. So we just kind of lost the thread on that. And it was pretty draconian. Uh, but now, uh, now things have cleared up a little bit. So I'll definitely be there. But this is exactly what I'm talking about, the Cardano budget. If you care about India and you want India adoption, well, why not in a marketing and adoption and an education program specifically oriented towards India? And how much of the Cardano budget ought to be allocated for that? 5%? 1%? 0.1%. See, when you have D-reps, you can have this conversation. Get Indian D-reps to join and represent. Just calling it how I hear it. This is the most delusional talk I've heard all week. Bro thinks he's super deep. I'm dying laughing. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Just keeping it real, man. 
Doesn't have to be deep to keep it real. Charles, you look good. What do you think about a Hosky side chain? Should all projects in Cardano aspire to be a side chain? Um, no, the vast majority of uh, projects uh, should be dApps or native assets or these things. Side chains make sense from the context that you're trying a completely different execution model, scripting language. You have very different demands about your, your data availability, your storage requirements, how you manage your blockchain. Uh, you need different things that a Warboros is not going to necessarily give you, and you want a different consensus notion, uh, these types of things. So it makes a lot of sense, for example, with World Mobile. You have a huge global network. You have hardware. You have Spectrum that's licensed. Uh, you have very heterogeneous user sets where the vast majority of people are consumers on handsets and a small backbone of people are providers and you need to federate that. So that's a very different network than let's say a CBDC uh, where there's just one entity at the top and it's pushing things down or asset backed stable coin, same notion, uh, or a very different entity than a very decentralized network like Cardano's consensus notion. Sidechains allow you to have these multiple models coexist in the same ecosystem and then create mutual network value for each other. But if your goal is to build a DEX, why would you care about any of those things? For example, you, you say, no, I want to run where all the liquidity is so everything can go through and I'm, my job is just to efficiently get value transfer. My scrotum has a better looking beard. You call me delusional. Now you're saying I have a scrotum beard or actually wait, your scrotum has a beard. There's like a full beard off your scrotum. I'm, I'm trying to understand the insult here, Kevin. Tell us how it's going at the Hoskinson Health and Wellness Clinic. Actually quite well. We have over 4,000 patients. Uh, we have multiple providers, mostly family practitioners and internists. Um, a few specialists coming in. Uh, next year, we'll have the full pharmacy, hyperbarics, and imaging operational. Lab is just turning on now. It takes a few months to get CLIA and the LIS and all the other things running. I was just up there, actually. And uh, right now, it's 10,000 square feet. And we're just about to build a giant extension on the back of it, 5,000 square foot tropical greenhouse. That's a bridge to a large steel structure that's connected to it, which will be about 20 plus thousand square feet with all of those additional lines. Uh, hyperbarics are looking good, and that program is uh, is going to be fully operational hopefully next year. A lot of training, a lot of certification, and you know, and normal physicians aren't trained on how to do that stuff, so you have to approach it systematically. But over four thousand patients, and that's a really good start for a thirty five hundred, a thirty five thousand person town. You know, it's more than ten percent of the population is uh, is patient already, and we just got started uh, this year. The quota. How are all the animals in the ranch getting along these days? They're good, doing really well. Hunting season's almost over for the bison, and they're doing good. 500-plus bison running around, and calving will occur next year, and uh, big elk herds. The elk and the bison kind of hang out. They have fun together. Charles, how are Cardano ambassadors appointed? That's a CF program at the moment. Cardano ambassadors should have their status renewed every 12 months. Yeah, there's some I, I would like to be able to vote for or not vote for. And let me tell you, there are Cardano ambassadors failing in their capacity. They should go. My view is the entire program should be deprecated and moved to a voted program. And basically people represent through some blockchain-based process. And frankly, there should just be a smart contract that uh, that people use for it. And then as part of the Cardano budget, a certain amount of funding goes every year to the ambassador program. You know, the foundation did a good job bootstrapping and carrying that forward, but 
you know, now we have voting, now we have on-chain governance. And so it makes more sense for that to occur because you get much better discovery of candidates. Because I mean, if you're sitting at a Swiss foundation, how are you going to know about what the person in New Zealand is doing? Uh, or, you know, how are you going to know about what the person in Chile is doing or something like that? It's really hard, no matter how on the ball or vigilant you are, you're just not going to, uh, not going to see those people. So let the blockchain be the broker for people to discover and then let people vote in their local clusters and distribute accordingly or run competing programs, for example. And then there's a democratic consent behind people's status. A lot of people are talking about how Hydra is flawed. You know, Hydra is not flawed, guys. When you have a product that is on very strong footing, if you have a ton of evidence about what its long-term capabilities can be, it evolves with more than 12 releases per year because they release, I think, every month or, or less with something new. And there's a lot of community participation and actual projects in your roadmap. And you're trying to solve real problems like large NFT drops or whatever. And it's something that's a priority. It, it'll get there. It's just a question of how long. Is it going to get there in three months, six months, one year, two years, three years? And, and how fast is that protocol evolving? So if you just take a look at Snapshot today and say, well, it just doesn't solve my problem. Okay, well, if you come back a year later, maybe it will. It's not going anywhere. It's a permanent piece of infrastructure that continues to evolve, and the scope of problems that it solves grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And I think this is an example of where a CEO looks at something different than an engineer would. So an engineer is in the weeds, and what they're trying to do is say, what is the best tool for the job? And if they don't have that tool or that tool I give you is not quite fit for purpose, they say it's the wrong tool. Well, the CEO looks at the state of all tools and says, okay, well, what processes do we need to put into place so that year by year, that engineer has a larger set of tools and a better set of tools to work with? And if we find a process where then in two, three, four, five years, we have the best tool set of any group of builders. I'd say that's mission accomplished. And if you look at Cardano, that's where we're at. We have Hydra as one set of tools. The sidechain strategy is another set of tools. The evolution of the extended UTXO and Plutus is another set of tools. Uh, a lot of off-chain stuff as another set of tools. Okay, well, any one of those things potentially could solve your problem. And I look at the evolution of those things and I say, okay, am I choosing, are we making the right bets? And so then the other thing is you have to get the right feedback. That's the point of a members-based organization being in charge of your product roadmap. Because then the people who are actually in the trenches and building have a direct line of communication to the product people to influence where the product goes so you can have better predictions about your sets of tools. That's what was done with Mithril and Hydra, where it went from nothing to where we're at with such a large group of people and doing interesting things. Now, is it perfect? No. Does it solve everybody's problems? Oh, Lord, no. But will it get to a point in the evolutionary horizon where it does solve a lot of problems for a lot of people? And the answer is yes. So what's the problem? What's the issue? Why, why, why are we having such a drama about the whole thing? We know the peak throughput can go in a certain direction because we modeled these types of things and we have competing protocols and products that have also demonstrated that. So we know where that story goes. Is there a need for the story to go in that particular direction today, right here, right now? Are we having $500 transaction fees with Cardano? Are you having to wait six hours to use a dApp in Cardano? No. So why would we need these things? Why is that the number one priority? Why not instead just follow the process and get the tools to gradually grow out? And it's free and open source and you can use it where and when you choose to use it. Here's what happened. People took Hydra outside of IO as a marketing thing. They made YouTube videos and said, Hydra is the secret weapon that's going to kill Ethereum and kill all these other guys. And Hydra is going to do this thing, million transactions per second. Because I read it in a blog post that that's its theoretical maximum or something like that. And then obviously if we have that, it's like it's, it's, it's the super weapon that will win the war and beat everybody. So they built this giant expectation vertical, okay? Missing the entire point 
that even if you had that capability, let's say you could do it, it wouldn't win because that's only one narrow dimension of a much broader war that you're fighting for the hearts and minds and for it's your DevX and your security and it's how you handle off chain and your storage layer, your data availability. There's dozens of dimensions that exist there. You have to look at all of them and say, holistically speaking, are this whole unit moving in the right direction? Or are we very brittle, narrow, and fragile? We have a very tiny bridge to success. And if that happens to not be the road we take, we've already automatically lost the fight. So when it didn't meet those narrow expectations, people said, well, obviously it's a scam. It's a failure. These people don't know what they're doing. They're all incompetent. Meanwhile, there are all these people building, doing great work and coming up with good ideas and they're thinking it through. And there's already next generation protocols. That's why there's Mithril 2 to succeed Mithril 1. And there's already discussions of how do we make that ubiquitous and actually even get it into the blockchain as some form of a data structure, like in the header or something. It's really powerful when you do that. Smart contracts can touch it and talk to it when you do that. Very good thing. Yeah, so that's just the uh, nature of how things go. And it's also an indication when people have never done product development or led a company or done software development, it's hard. It's a real job, and you have to understand a lot about these things in order to be successful. Is IOG working on a high-level project? You can't provide details yet, which will impact adoption on larger... Well, I, we're talking about those things. Like RealFi is a direct extension of all the Africa stuff. It's getting put into a dedicated leadership structure, a dedicated company. And we think that that's the thing that's really going to create a, a continental adoption and get a lot of users into Cardano and Lace and actually a lot of utility in TVL and the chain. But that's just one example. Do you where Dan Larimer is now? What? <laughs> do you do I know where Dan Larimer is? Probably retired, living off the EOS money. He raised four billion dollars and then said, walked away. Doing stuff. Charles, what can be done to stop the Cardano fund? It's been too damaging for too long. I feel it every day. It makes me older and fatter and more worn down. Well, the white, my scraggly, scrotal beard. Yeah. Um, next year, it's just going to have to be funded. Uh, you guys are going to have to come together and you're going to have to have some conversations uh, and uh, decide how much you want to spend on creating a marketing function and a brand function for Cardano. We've done what we can with Cardano 360 and these other things, but never really the place of a core developer to try to learn and invent how to be ecosystem builders and marketers. There are much better, cheaper, more qualified people uh, than us to pursue that. And frankly, that needs to be decentralized. So the point of an on-chain government is to make a priority of these types of things. And then I think things will get a lot better. You know, the Ethereum community they'll also be a lot happier with SIP 1694 because what will happen is they can't reconcile Cardano being successful or being legitimate. So they'll say, ah, Cardano fired its founder, Charles has been fired, and now Cardano is successful. That, that'll be the narrative of 2024 if 1694 comes through. And then they'll like Cardano. They'll suddenly want to work with it. They'll enjoy it. They'll embrace it. The FUD will go way down. This is just personal, and there's a very strong distaste among certain people there. And that's all right, you know, and that's the point of decentralization, and it's, it gives you an anchor uh, to to be able to be in the club. So I think that'll help a lot too. You know, tone things down a little bit. Why did you say a Ripple settlement would be catastrophic for the crypto sector? Well, let's just think it through. I know the XRP people sometimes have trouble with this, but let's take a step back and really think it through. 
if Ripple had settled with the Securities Exchange Commission, they would implicitly be saying that Ripple was a security, but the issues are resolved. And perhaps they'd get some clarity to move forward, but that would legitimize and embolden the SEC to continue going after layer ones with the same arguments they hit Ripple with. If Ripple won a court case, which they did, the judge would say the SEC is wrong and the secondary market sales of tokens are not securities transactions. They're not investment contracts as defined by Howey, in which case that strengthens the ability of the entire industry to fight the SEC against regulatory overreach and regulation through enforcement. So which one would you rather have? A localized potential victory like what EOS got with the Block 1 settlement for just that particular ecosystem? Or would you like something that results in benefit for the entire cryptocurrency space? And given how much time, effort, and money had been expended to get there, it would have been catastrophic to lose that piece of bedrock that would help every single cryptocurrency project and company like Coinbase uh, be able to preserve and protect the liquidity of the industry and the operations of many of the core developers in the industry. It's not okay, regulation through enforcement. It's not okay to say come in and register, but then there's no valid path to do that. When you, in 2021, give a company like Coinbase the ability to do an IPO, so yeah, they have an S1, they tell you your business model and say, we're okay with retail investors buying shares in your company. We don't think that's going to harm them. And we think the claims you're making are lawful and legitimate. And then two years later, sue them for that exact same business model and say, we're not beholden to the decision of the S1. What does come in and register mean? What does it mean? It basically means tell us everything about your business model so we can figure out where to sue you. That's the perception. This is not the right culture. It's not the right environment. It's not collegial. It's not collaborative. There's no way to comply because they purposely prevent compliance. It's basically Kafka invented an agency at the moment. So anything that basically constrains and limits that aggressive enforcement is good. And anything that enables and empowers that aggressive enforcement is catastrophic. Does this even make any sense at all? Should Israel use nukes on its enemies? Uh, what is to be done with Palestinian sympathizers? Do you, do you, that's nonsense. Come on. Come on. Think, think that. Come on. Like, like in the Gaza Strip, a lot of those people are also Israeli citizens. Or so they're going to nuke their own people? Come on. That's a difficult situation, the, the whole Israel-Palestine situation. And there's so many layers to it. I'd really encourage you to listen to Lex Friedman's interviews. He did a series of interviews which are very, very good. Um, he interviewed Bibi Netanyahu. He interviewed Yuval Harari. And then he interviewed a Palestinian poet. Um, and all three of them had radically different views because they're radical different sides. Um, of the entire conflict. And so that th those three things together be about five hours of your life, six hours of your life, but probably the most informative uh, five, six hours of your life you could ever watch because it would unlock a lot of perspectives you've probably never seen or heard uh, about Israeli society, Palestinian society, and uh, the plight and pains and the amount of fragmentation that is currently there. It's a very difficult region to manage. There has been incredible progress with the Abraham Accords. Um, and there's overall the directionality of peace is occurring, but you have flare-ups that occur from uh, from time to time. And this Hamas thing is an example of a flare-up, which will be met, unfortunately, um, with brutal retaliation, which will then lead to more violence as well. It's a cycle, but they get smaller and smaller, the circles over time. There's no more Yom Kippur wars.
All right, we're just going to go ahead and uh, meet this guy. I don't know why people sit in the channel all day long and just spam. Why were no counterattack by crypto companies on the SEC? Why didn't you all unite against the Securities Exchange Commission's decision? There's nothing we can do. I mean, we tried. Lots of money was spent. And the issue was that there were certain groups of people in 2022, especially SBF, who were literally trying to create a regulatory structure where uh, their nepotistic companies could run and control things and everybody else be shut out. Uh, the problem is not everybody in the crypto industry's incentives are completely aligned. If you're a regulated business and you look a lot like a bank, you're totally okay with them passing a law that's saying only you multi-billion dollar regulated businesses can do business in the industry because basically prevents anybody from competing with you and all the startups get wiped out overnight. So they're not aligned from a regulatory viewpoint uh, with those guys. And we had a lot of those guys floating around who really want to dip in, who are now crypto companies. And then also the Bitcoin maximalists basically said, anything that's not Bitcoin is evil, it's a scam, it's wrong, and they should all be banned. I'll give you an example of this, my real life example that I saw. So uh, we saw early drafts of Financial Innovation Act uh, from Senator Lummis. And we had many discussions with the office as she did with hundreds of people across the industry. Uh, the, the people at that office were awesome. They talked to Coinbase, they talked to Kraken, they talked to former regulators like the CFTC. Uh, you know, they talked to all different people trying to get a good holistic understanding of how one should write such a big bill. Well, when the Bitcoin people came and talked, uh, they, they said, oh, you should put in the bill anything but Bitcoin as a security. That's their recommendation. How do you work with people like that? These maximalists who, who say these things. Everything's a scam. Everything's wrong. There is no innovation but Bitcoin. Only Bitcoin is real. And all other people are, are evil. Got Corey. And he, see, I run into him at Milken. The only thing he can tweet out is how I look physically. I, I'm fat and I have a pathetic entourage. That's what he adds to the conversation. Do you really want to be sitting next to that guy speaking before Congress? Can we unify? No. And unfortunately, those are the spokesmen on that side of the aisle. Um, if they had better spokesmen, well, they had them, like Mike Hearn, Gavin and Drayson, others. They got kicked out, replaced with them and crazy old Max Kaiser, who, by the way, launched his own coin. And now, But we're all scammers now. Yeah, so there's just not much you can do with that. So you just, you know, you do your best. And um you have to fight for the things you believe in and push for things, but U.S. system is rigged. You'll be happy to know that Yonatan Somopinski said as he and his family are okay in Israel. That's good. And I know you read about the ghost inspector protocols. Yeah, they were very good protocol for their time. They started a conversation about how do you go from a single chain to a DAG there was Ghost, Spectre, Phantom, and then a whole litany of other things. And uh, some people took it in a particular direction, like uh, Tangle and Iota, for example, and other people took it in a different direction. Uh, but whether you're single chain or DAG is completely immaterial to scaling today. Uh, but for its time, it was a, a major step forward. And uh, Aviv Zohar was the uh, was the other one who was uh, pushing for it. But Yanatan's a good guy. You know, I, the first time I met him was Corfu many years ago at Bitcoin Summer School. Um, and we've always kept a friendly rapport through the years. Did you change your opinion on Vivek Ramaswamy? I like Vivek. You know, he's a young guy, fresh blood, uh, real smart, real talented, stands no chance of winning the primary. It's Trump's primary. He's got over 60% of the vote. It's really hard to beat a former president who wants to go again, and he's still popular in his own party. He's not running for president. He's running for vice president of the cabinet. Uh, and uh, if Trump called him and said, be my VP, he'd say yes. And that's okay. He's like my age. <laughs> he's got a very bright future. If he really wants to be a politician and keep pushing forward, 
uh, he'll get somewhere. He really will. You know, he'll he'll get into the cabinet. He'll get into the uh, he could even have a shot at the presidency. But it's hard to become the president of the United States in your mid 30s really is. Um, no matter how rich you are, how handsome you are, how talented you are, it is a tall, tall cliff to climb. Yeah, we thought that before uh, we elected Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, names don't matter anymore and backgrounds don't matter anymore. We're past all that. I think Vivek has a great chance. And um, I think that the United States could elect a guy like him. The thing is, though, that you have to build a track record. You have to build rapport. You have to build relationships. It takes a long time to do all that stuff. Ronald Reagan, a lot of people don't know this, ran for president twice before he ran in 1980. He ran 1968 and he ran 1976. And he ran again in the primary against Gerald Ford and in 1968. Uh, he ran in the primary against Nelson Rockefeller and he ran against um, uh, Nixon. And uh, he started in politics in 1964, working with Barry Goldwater as a, a surrogate in that ca disastrous campaign. And, and But he was the only shining star they had. And then he became governor of California, built political career. So it took between 1964 when he entered and 1980 to actually ascend to the presidency. It's a long journey. It's a lot of things. And he had to lose twice before he won on the third time. So, you know, if Vivek is really serious about this, if he wants to go on the Reagan journey, he can, but it's going to take some time. Donald Trump was thinking about running for president seriously since 2000. It took him 16 years to go from 2000 to 2016. And he was waiting for the right timing. He almost did it in 2012. But he did a calculation and realized that America wasn't really in that right structure. But he'd play golf with Rush Limbaugh and other people. You know, and, you know, every two, three months, Limbaugh would come to his golf club and he'd talk to Limbaugh extensively for hours. Like, what? Where's the Republican Party at? What's going on? He'd call Steve Bannon. You know, he'd talk to all these guys. And what he did is he took Mike Savage's borders, language, culture, whole framework, combined it with some of B uh, Bannon's nationalist framework. And then did the good old fashioned Roger Stone Nixon political ops and put these things together into kind of a coalition and then ran it on a very populist build the wall, lock them up, uh, anti establishment candidacy. Radically different Trump from 2000, radically different Trump from the 1980s. And so you, that's the kind of reinvention you have to have. The Vic is following Trump style national populism. You can't out Trump Trump. It's just not possible. He's Trump. You're not going to go and be better at Trump than being Trump. The best you can do is be a crude simulacra like uh, Ron DeSantis, who's basically betting that Trump will be taken off the table because he'll be in a prison cell and ineligible somehow. And so the voters have to go somewhere. And either they go to him or DeSantis, uh, either him or Vivek. Those are the two guys vying for that throne. And he has a better organization. But even that, he's fucked it up, which is sad for him. And he had no reason to run. He should have waited until uh, 2024 because he would have been in uh, 2028. He would have been in the cabinet and got or been the VP pick. RFK Jr. is a real interesting guy. He's a real American, you know, grew up and he's got an amazing life story. He's experienced more than any of us could imagine politics, the highest level. His dad was assassinated. His uncle was assassinated. I mean, he he was eight years old, you know, living in a living in a place where there's Russian spies talking to him, and that was the intrigue he grew up with. And he's a smart guy and a very disciplined guy, and he's been through a lot, drug addiction, all kinds of things, uh, and survived it. And, and that's an amazing American story. And the fact his own political party has thrown him away when he's part of the royalty of that party because he has inconvenient statements is just an indication of where that party is and how they, uh, how they handle people and how loyal they are to people. Can't trust them. Republicans are no better at this point. Charles, you've been referred to as part of the problem in crypto comments. What do you want me to answer that question with Johnny Blaze? What's the point? Honestly, <laughs> why ask it? 
please do an X space with Vivek. Actually, his team did reach out to me. I would love to do that. That would be really fun. And I would love uh, to ask him about the whole cryptocurrency industry and what he thinks about DeFi and Web3. I'd love to ask about NFTs and intellectual property. I'd love to ask about the convergence of large language models and uh, the centralization of control and if cryptocurrencies could be used. I would actually prepare for that interview and I'd Joe Rogan the shit out of it. So it would be a lot of fun to go do a one or two hour Twitter space and, uh, and have that come through. RFK Jr. is nuts, literally. But every American is. Every American is. Think about that. Yeah, You really think when you go to a bar, you sit next to the guy, that person is all there? And when he's sitting next to you, do you think you're all there? Every single person is not polished and has some wonky beliefs and ideas. Uh, you got the lady at the crystal store who's talking about the aliens from different planets. Um, you know what? Still probably a good person, a still person that you might trust to, you know, come over your house, watch your kids or, uh, you know, have drinks with, or maybe it's your best friend. Every single American has some ideas that are a little out there and that's okay. And we don't judge people on that because even though they're radically different, their lived experiences are radically different from our own. Uh, some people grew up under extreme duress and trauma and abuse. Could you imagine having your father assassinated in a very public way when you're a kid? Right after five years later, your uncle was assassinated in a very public way. And could you imagine that they were probably killed by the own government that they worked for? And every single day, people come up to you and tell you, isn't it a shame the CIA killed your father? Can you imagine that lived experience? And so before you judge and, you know, before you do that, it's the old saying, you know, speck in my eye, log in yours. Uh, everybody's got a little nutty stuff, but the question is, do they have integrity? That's the core of it. Do they have integrity? And do they honestly care about people? Is there real empathy there? And do they want to make the world a better place? And can they listen? Can they learn? And can they assist with you? That's what you look for in good leaders, not ideological perfection. Charles, are all midnight validators, SPOs, maybe you're more comfortable answering that one. Um, for SPOs uh, in midnight, the goal is to deploy Minotaur, and that means it's multi-resource consensus. So the midnight sidechain, what it will be able to do is bootstrap from the SPO set, but then it can introduce multiple consensus algorithms. And longer term, I'd like to see a proof of work side, specifically proof of useful work. Snarks, recursive snarks uh, are very, very, very heavy instruments. And if you have useful work, what you can do is you can actually create an incentives layer to do all of those heavy calculations as distributed computation. And then it's a proof acceleration layer for the system. So no matter how heavy your zero knowledge system gets, your user experience is quite good because the majority of your proof work is being done in the construction and uh, transmission uh, and validation through a consensus mechanism. That's the long-term direction I'd like to see that go. But with Minotaur, you can chain multiple consensus protocols together, a BFT protocol with a proof of stake protocol, with a proof of work protocol, and you can make it dynamic. So over time they can move. So it can start as a side chain and become a layer one. A layer one could go and become a side chain and go back to a layer one. That's why I made that statement about Algorand. I said, if you're having trouble with your incentives model, come over to Cardano side, We'll take care of that for a while while you fix all that stuff. And then you can go back to being a layer one. You don't have to do stuff like print a bunch of money and give it to a foundation or something like that to, to, to go and run the network while you figure out your incentive layer. Little stuff like that. It makes it much easier. And that's that's a true partnership. People make partnerships not because you're a slave to an entity. That's a very different relationship. You make partnership because they have something that you want and you have something they want and you work together. Now, when those facts and circumstances change, the partnership can break up or it can strengthen based upon the direction it goes. And the point of Minotaur is it's a regulating function to take you in either direction. So it's much more fair for everybody.
Is there any end user application of DIDs in progress or available? Yeah, so there's gonna be an integration of Prism into Lace. Um, Lace is Prism curious, Prism is Lace curious. They're kind of talking to each other on the weekends and Mike Ward is talking to Dave and it's like, hey girl, how you doing? Um, and at some point there'll be an identity center there. And that's the first B2C application of Prism. The thing is that Prism, they did a 1.0 we did the MOE deal. We did a lot of other stuff around it. And we learned enormous amount from that. And then like any software, you go back to the drawing board and we rewrote the whole stack with Prism 2. And that complete rewrite is near done. And it has all those nice things like multi-tenancy and revocation and all the things you come to know and love, but also direct path to a non-creds and other standards that exist in the, the identity stack that the W3C and other organizations created for DIDs. So once that stack is fully in place, it's very easy to put that Scala code as the back end and then put an identity center into Lace and make it an integral component of the creation of a wallet. Then you can use it for estate planning, account recovery, device syncing, uh, enhanced security layers for your wallet. But then also you get Prism features like potentially access control. It's like, like a Bitwarden style play, just dozens of things like that that fit into that model. Uh, and it's a great showcase of the power of a consumer uh, self-sovereign identity application where you own your identity and not a central cloud provider owns that. So yeah, absolutely. They're curious about it. It's just the stars have to align and they they got both busy schedules, but uh, they're moving pretty quickly. The release cadence of Prism is like, I think every six weeks. Um, so they're, they're kicking ass, that team. And Lace is monthly. <laughs> Hello, Charles. Will there be phone apps released for Lace? It is on the roadmap. Uh, what I did is I said, let's really push and make sure we're an awesome browser wallet with all those things, but build it with a stack where it's very easy to do code port to the cell phone and to the desktop application. Uh, so right now we're really focused on getting a lot of core features into the browser side. And there's a few surprises we have towards the end of the year, at least I think people will be very excited about. Uh, and uh, once we're past that, then I think the next priority will be a cell phone app. I'm less bullish about cell phone apps because I can't control the roadmap for that. Apple does and Google does. That's the problem of centralization. To get in the app store, they tell you what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. So if I build some amazing feature that the entire company, com community loves and Apple says, well, we don't like that feature, I have to, I have to remove it. Uh, you know, here's a great example. Amazon's big company, Jeff Bezos, he's got a lot of money. He's got the space penis. And he's got all the stuff. He's, he's kicking ass, man. $200 billion. And Google told him, hey, you can't buy Kindle books. Sorry, we, we we want our money. And Amazon says, well, that's crazy. We're not going to give you 20% of our Kindle sales in our Amazon app. And they said, well, well, then you can't do it. So despite the scale and scope of Amazon, I can't buy a Kindle book through the Amazon app on my phone. I have to go to the browser. Now, if a company of that scale and value and that much power can't influence Google or Epic Games or any of these things, what the hell chance do we have for Lace Wallet? So that's why we say the purest form is the desktop in the browser, because there we have an enormous level of control over what goes into that application, especially the desktop. And then when you go to the cell phone, unfortunately, the gatekeeping function there is so strong that 
no matter what we do, it's a subset of our vision of uh, experience for the user. It's why I hate gatekeepers. It's why I hate centralization. It's why I hate middlemen. Because is Google helping me write that application? Is Apple helping me write that application? Is, are Google and Apple making my application better for me? No, they're not really doing much for me. I'm writing the code. I'm paying for that. However, they get to tell me my business. And they get to tell every other app developer the same thing. Just a great case study in uh, this. Charles, what do you think about Coach and the CU Boulder football program? You know, I, I went to CU Boulder when we had Hawkins, Dan Hawkins, and he put his son in charge. <laughs> his son was the quarterback, couldn't even see over the line. So it was just a sad, sad time. Uh, the CU program's killing it right now. They're doing a great job. It's a good team. There are very good people there, and those students are fired up. Um, it's almost like um, USC in the old days with uh, – uh, Pete Carroll and they had Matt Leiner and Reggie Bush and all that stuff. We're, we're building in that direction. We're building in that direction. Pretty excited. Make lace for graphene OS. Boy, I'd love that. I'd love to be a core developer of graphene OS and just make sure they keep with their release cycle and their quality. Love the product. It's awesome. And being tethered to pixels, not so bad. I just wish they could take more advantage of some of the local AI features. That'd be pretty cool. Cardano smartphone would be cool. <laughs> You're running out of ideas when you build your own smartphone. <laughs> Two pens. What's the progress on encrypted paper wallets? It's in the feature queue. Uh, but it is behind hardware multi-sig and multi-sig. So delegation portfolios and multi-sig are both things we care a lot about. Boatload of stuff has to be done there. Huge security enhancement also adds a lot of treasury management capabilities for LACE. Uh, and then the next step is it would be nice to do encrypted paper wallets. But it's in the queue. We know about it. It's just it's not the highest priority in the product backlog. All right, we're just going to go ahead and uh, ban Johnny Blaze, too. There we go. Why do people sit in the channel? Maybe the audience can help me with this one. Why would you sit in the channel in, for an hour just be like, you are evil. You are a scammer. You are a bad person. Why did you suck all these people into your web of lies? Look, it's Sunday. It's 1030 in the morning. What else is going on in your life, man? Is this 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 is what you want? This is what your life is. You're just you're just gonna sit there and just be like the whole day. Is did you get some sick fucked up joy out of it? Is this your fetish? I, I don't understand people sometimes. Go read a book, go to the park, get it, get an animal to play with or something. That last one, I'm not so sure. Maybe those people shouldn't be playing with animals. Hi, Charles. Is there a tentative release time for input endorsers? Not yet. Research is still underway. It's um, You have software readiness levels. It's still low on the SRL side of things. People love to hate watch things. Hate watch. Is that like Baywatch, but it's not hot girls, it's lemon party? Welcome to hate watch. We're going to play some pickleball. Did you block me because I said my scrotum has a better looking beard? No, I blocked you because your scrotum has a better looking beer. That's weird, man. You should get that waxed. I 
Hi, Charles. I'll be starting an NBA next year, and I'm wondering what do you think, uh, what do you recommend to build a good research background while I do it and enter a potential PhD route for blockchain? I need the MBA. I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to accomplish there. Um, I don't really think NBAs are worth anything. It's just not. Uh, you know, um, they used to be, they were a huge accomplishment and a big way of differentiating yourself from many other people, but there's just so many MBAs now and there's so much uh, dilution of that credential, unless you're coming from very prestigious elite institution where you're basically buying the network like a Stanford or a Harvard MBA. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I much more value what engineers have to say than people who've trained as MBAs or consultants. Um, and great example would be look at Lisa Sue. Uh, she has a PhD in, I believe, electrical engineering from MIT, CEO of AMD. Uh, look at Sasha Nadella. Yes, I do believe he has an MBA, but the credential that matters is the master's in computer science that he has with that. My view is do what MIT did. Uh, they actually have a real cool program. Let me show you guys this. And I'm not saying go to MIT. I mean, if you can get in, congratulations, but that's a real fucking hard thing. But uh, MIT dual MBA, MS engineering. If you're really, you know, seeking something, MIT has a real cool program. I would highly recommend this if you're going to go into any of the STEM field. Uh, but basically, it's a dual degree, and you get a master's in engineering, and you get an MBA. If you combine those two things together, what you're doing is you're showing you have rigor, and you understand and can go deep into something, and you can build stuff, and you understand how stuff works around you in life. And then the MBA says, hey, you got, you got a business clue. You actually know what's going on. Uh, those types of candidates, that's good. That's good to go. PhD is useless unless you plan to do something that requires a PhD. Now, that's my opinion as an employer, though. You know, I've hired thousands of people throughout my career and I now have about 10 years of track record looking into which employees worked out, and which employees didn't work out. I like working with rigorous people and deep people. What about just being self-taught as far as business? Yeah, you can do that too. Start a small business and run it for a few years. You'll learn basically everything an MBA learns, man, more. Um, and you'll go through hell. It's very hard. Charles, do you still watch Dr. John Campbell? I do. It's a good guy. Well, no, I'm talking about the concept of dual degrees in general. If you're going to spend two years getting an MBA, go find a program where you do a master's in engineering and a master's in business in two years. A little harder. It's a lot more work, but that credential is significantly more valuable in my book than uh, than any MBA credential. Um, and actually, the master's product management, CMU has a really good program. It's about a year and a half master's product management. Uh, that's, that's significantly better than an MBA because you're actually accountable to the product development process. That said, I mean, if you like get into business school at Sloan or, uh, you know, Stanford or something like that. I said, okay, it's still fucking amazing. You'll, you'll get a good network with it, but you're gonna spend a lot of money.
when are you developing that video game? Well, you know, I got Reflect and they do video game development. In fact, we actually have uh, the creator of Wasteland, one of the creators of Wasteland uh, working at Reflect. He's a game developer. He's employee number eight at Interplay. I did Earthworm Jim and a bunch of other things. So there's a good game development team that's at Reflect and they're doing Girl Fight. And they bought the IP for Descent and all this other stuff. So a good catalog that they're putting together to kind of show uh, uh, how you do GameFi on a blockchain. But uh, Legends of Valor is very special to me and I'm not going to make it unless I'm the game developer. I'm actually the director and, and I'm running that. Um, so if it takes five years to have enough time for it, I'll, uh, I'll take the time and I'm going to go real deep and very specific view on what needs to be done. Crystal Mines was my brother's favorite game. We bought that and we're going to release that as a browser game. And it'll just be something to have there. You can run it offline and it'll be kind of an addictive thing you play while on an airplane or something like that. Do you lift weights? I wish I did. I am A5 Wagyu, guys. 37% body fat. Can you believe it? Had a DEXA scan at my clinic. I got to fix that shit. Come put me in an early grave. It's ironic. I'm doing all this anti-aging stuff. <laughs> we're talking about, we're talking about like uh, how to use drugs uh, to enhance stem cells being leaked into um your uh, your blood and then collect it through apheresis and then you have mesenchymal stem cells that are pretty good and then upgrading amplifying and growing those in bioreactors and then reinjecting them with the right environment to you know rejuvenate people you know there's deep deep technical conversations and i sit here thinking to myself if we do a really good job we'll add a few more years and make people feel healthier but diet sleep and exercise you do a really good job with those three things get another 20 years on your life and they're good years your well span your uh, lifespan and health span grow and just not your lifespan and uh, that's not the stuff i've been doing got the aura ring so i am getting better sleep nutrition is the next really improve that and then obviously exercise has to come along but we will get it done Have you ever beat Earthworm Jim? No one has ever beaten Earthworm Jim. No, 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 no. How do you like your bison cooked? Medium rare. Hi, Charles. I'm a Cardano ambassador from Ghana. Um, any word of motivation for me? Well, first, thank you so much for the support. And uh, my recommendation is just know the protocol, know the people. Uh, get involved in SanchoNet. Uh, get involved in SIP 1694. Uh, we are looking for a lot of great leadership representation around the world. And so would love to see you try to become a, a delegated rep. Uh, and be involved and intersect in that entire process. You know, the best way of getting inspired and motivated is to connect into the broader ecosystem and find common things and find a problem you care a lot about that you're really motivated about. Uh, and then make that problem something that we can solve as an ecosystem. Have you ever tried eight sleep? No, I don't know what that is. But I will look it up. Eat, sleep. Is AI a better coder? Within five years, it will be. Making a habit of stretching at least a little bit as uh, every now and then is also extremely beneficial. Yeah, every study shows that some baseline cardio and some baseline stretching is awesome. Yoga is a really good thing because you also get the breathing with it too. Take care of your health, Charles. We need you around from years to come. <laughs> I, I'm trying. Although I admit there's a lot of people in the chat that would love and relish if I died. Could you imagine if I perished? That was announced. How 
disgusting the comments would be on Twitter and other places. Ding dong, the scammer's gone. It's um, just where people are at. It's on them, not me. Do live yoga. <laughs> not my current state. You guys do not want to see me do yoga. I, I did the one picture while gardening in my black shirt, and that's become a meme for uh, how, how uh, pudgy I am. Actually, you know, there's an interesting story. Um, Alfred Nobel, everybody knows him for the Nobel Prize. But actually, when he was alive, uh, he was mostly known as the dynamite guy. He had built explosives and made weapons. And when his brother Ludwig died, uh, they published by mistake his obituary. And so he was in a rare position where the papers actually published what they thought about Alfred. And they said, oh, God, I, I have a, a real PR problem. I need to fix this. And so he created the Nobel Prize as a uh, basically a way of, of cleaning up his brand and reputation. And nobody remembers the explosives, but they all remember the prestigious prize. So sometimes it is good to you know, have a vehicle upon which people tell you what they really think. And you can always intervene. How tall is JJ? Six foot three and a half. Do you like gyros? Yes, I do. And the sagaraki and you know, all this stuff. It's good stuff. I love Greek food. My husband met you at the trade show in Vegas last weekend. He was so happy. His name is Blaine. You two talked briefly about your Lex Friedman interview. Our girl turns uh, one next week. Well, thank you so much, Amy. And it was great talking to your husband there at NFT XLV. He's a nice guy. Will you sue me if I make a tragic comic and dystopian game about you where people are hunting you with a torch yelling, burn the Ada and release it on Steam? If you make that game, I will play that game. Eight Sleep is a temperature controlled mattress cover. Research shows it improves sleep quality. Says cool guy. Okay, well, take a look at it. When Rogan, I've been trying to get on Joe Rogan. It's just never found the time. We'll get it done, though. Will you come back to Kenya? We got a business in Kenya now, man. That's John O'Connor. He's in Nairobi. Of course we're going to come back to Kenya. I love it. Cotter's Lodge, all the stuff. Crypto Crow, how you been, man? Good to see you. I spoke to you in Toronto in August about quantum, uh, uh, quantum security. It was a pleasure to meet you. Well, thank you, sir. Pleasure to meet you, too. Will you come to Portugal one day? Yeah, I'll be there for Web Summit, actually, at the end of November, uh, middle of November, speaking at Web Summit. Are you barefoot now, Charles? Well, I am wearing barefoot shoes. I got uh, zeros on. Hey, Charles, do you, have you heard when that Netflix show will happen? So Jason Cohen is doing it for Netflix. Yeah, I think you're referring to the documentary that he's shooting for Avi, of which I'm a part of it, probably 2024. Um, Jason has a habit of taking a long time for things, but I do believe um, it'll come out next year.
What's your favorite flower? It's the stargazer lily. And yes, we will make one that glows in the dark. I love floriculture. What will happen to Cardano if you die? Well, it'll be a lot less fun, but uh, yeah, we're still moving forward. Hey, Charles, how do you think the community will react to you donating 300 million aid to the Cardano treasury? They'll give you nothing for it. You'll get uh, one like on Twitter and then they'll hate me the next day. Look at Stellar when they burnt all the shit. <laughs> you get nothing for it. Don't play to the crowd, guys. Keep your principles and move forward. Oof, Web Summit. They almost crucified you last time. Yeah, they put me on with Ben McKenzie and uh, some other gal. And they they basically just came at me. And I was like, okay, I, I'm not Sam. I didn't start uh, FTX. Why are you trying to put us in the same bucket? He's just, mad he, uh, he's just mad he lost money on Bitcoin. And so now Bitcoin's a scam. We're all securities and uh, we're all evil. Just who these people are. How serious is the USA border situation? It's absolutely terrible. And it's a national tragedy. We can't secure our borders. You're not a nation if you don't have borders. And there are many different ways you can do it. Um, and, you know, this is an example of the cynicism of uh, America's immigration policy. You know, uh, Bush, back in, I think it was 2005, wanted a guest worker program. And he was a border governor, understood the issue very well. Uh, and really all you need to do is kind of three things and you've mostly resolved the issue. The first thing is birthright citizenship in the United States is a consequence as a Supreme Court decision. I believe it was Tau versus Nichols, like the 1880s or 1890s. And uh, what happened was that um, they had a, a Chinese em a, a person who was born in San Francisco um, leave to China, come back. And when he came back, they said, oh, you're not a citizen. You can't come back. He said, I was born here. I'm a citizen. So they basically created a very loose standard saying that people born under the jurisdiction of the United States um, are U.S. citizens. And it's a very bizarre standard because if you're on vacation in China and you happen to have your baby in China, the Chinese government is going to say, well, you're now a Chinese citizen. Your son is now a Chinese citizen. Congratulations. It's Countries typically don't do that, but this is the only country, one of the few countries where that's an open standard and it's just an artifact of Supreme Court decision. So what needs to happen is you issue an executive order changing that policy and then let the new Supreme Court take a look at it and clean it up a little bit. Uh, and then at some point there has to be a discussion and probably an overhaul of that, that whole construction because there's a world of difference between people who come here to work for a period of time or get educated for a period of time and people who have an intention to settle ruts and build things here. And if you create anchors where their children that they happen to have while they're here suddenly become U.S. citizens, then you've created this weird policy where the child is a citizen, but the parents are not. So what do you do about it? Deport the parents, but you can't keep the child and make them a ward of the state. It makes no sense at all. Uh, so that that house has to be cleaned up. Once that's cleaned up, it's much easier to do a guest worker program because you have a whole collection of jobs, especially in the Southwest, where people come on a seasonal basis to work and they go home. If there is no concern that those people are going to create permanent roots and displace the economy, uh, then politically speaking, it's a lot easier to get a program like that. And then suddenly that documents about 10 to 15 million of the uh, of the illegal immigration population that uh, that's here. Um, and then you have a whole group of people who created roots. They've been here for a long time. We call those the dreamers. And what you do is you just say, okay, well, now that we have the new program, let's just go ahead and roll those people in and give them citizenship. It's not really that hard. And why wouldn't you? If you're like 19 years old and you came across the border at six months old, 
you speak English, you don't speak Spanish, as an example. You went through K through 12 education and you're completely acclimated. There's no real meaningful difference between that person and your average U.S. citizen. It's just they happen to have been bored on the other side of the border and they came across at six months. It just doesn't make any sense to say there shouldn't be a, a, just a give them citizenship, move on. Uh, so that would clear a large chunk of the queue. Then you can drill down on the law enforcement component of it, build a border wall in certain places, electronic fences in other places, uh, and use modern technology like drone surveillance and satellites and these things. And there's a lot of really advanced tech now to actually detect tunnels. And then you can kind of close it off. And then what has to happen is the United States has to actually hold Mexico and Central America in particular accountable for the cartels and have a real conversation about how do we clean that up? problem is the counterparties on the other side are not honest. The, the, the federal agents work with the, the drug lords. And why wouldn't they? Because if they don't, they get killed. You can't really judge people in the military, or the police force on that side of the aisle, if basically they're given uh, an offer they can't refuse. You know, either work with us or we kill you or we'll get rid of you because your boss works with us and he's going to destroy your career. So it's kind of like steroids in baseball. If, if you let people do it, everybody has to do it because they have to stay in that environment. So the key there is you have to work out a deal at the highest levels and say, basically, if you tolerate this type of criminality and conduct and violence, there's going to be a series of sanctions and economic consequences that will be levied. And also, we will hold the government legally accountable up to and including making them complicit in the murders and the things and actually issue warrants for their arrest and drag them to the United States and, and actually hold them accountable. You start doing that very quickly, very, very quickly, those swamps get drained because you've created incentives at the highest levels. And yes, you're going to have to give them resources. So U.S. special forces are going to have to work with the Mexican government in particular, because usually the, when they talk about immigration policy, that's where people focus the most effort on. And you can clean it up in a few years. But, you know, it's an all enhanced thing. You need to talk to the BORTAC guys. You need to talk to the border governors. And you just have to look at things in layers and you work your way through. What you can't do is a one size fits all single bill, have to pass it with find out in it, and then say everybody is, is evil or wrong who disagrees with me. The Democrats have absolutely no incentive to solve this problem because what they want to do is wait for it to become so bad that they can get blanket citizenship, and they're hoping that that becomes a monolithic voting block that will turn Texas blue. So they have no incentive to solve the problem. They'll just their their solution is basically citizenship for all. Um, the Republicans have no incentive to solve it because they are addicted to the cheap labor. They really love that, and that's what their their people tell them to do. So it's an example of the uniparty basically looking at the political reality and saying we just don't want to touch it. You don't want to solve it, but you can solve it in layers and you have to solve some things on the, like the legacy stuff, like Tal versus Nichols. And you have to solve some things, uh, basically working with the border governors and building walls in certain places, electronic fences and other places and kind of, and then you have to also look at which governments are the biggest offenders of the problem and then gradually work with them to kind of tamper it down. And uh, you have a carrot and a stick where you create incentives, but then disincentives as well. Uh, and uh, that with other things like, okay, well, which legacy people are just going to roll into citizenship? Uh, that's how you solve that. Uh, it takes a little time and you have to be intellectually honest about it. And you say there's a world of difference between um, a person from Russia who's illegally crossed the border to be a spy in the United States and a person who's lived in the United States since they were six months old and they're brought over with their parents uh, and have been educated K through 12, potentially up including college. And for all intents and purposes, they think they're an American. And they may even have documents that show that way that are forged. And then they discover only after they're trying to join the military or go to college or something like that, that they're not a citizen. Uh, so that's that's not the same category. And to treat them like that is is not only unethical, it's just stupid policy. But you can't you can't have those conversations right now in the current political environment. You just can't because there's no incentives to have those types of conversations and kind of think around the problem and resolve the problem. 
How is Midnight planned on being used in the financial sector? And are there any major partners in play yet? I really am excited about integration of Midnight with security tokens and talking about regulated value transfer protocols. We're going to talk all about that at the Cardano Summit. And actually, I think the perfect jurisdiction is Abu Dhabi and Dubai for this because they're progressive enough on the regulatory side to enable these things. And you can kind of create a shadow financial market of Africa in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and make it 100% blockchain based. And I could imagine DEXs trading securities issued in Ethiopia and Kenya and other places in Dubai or Abu Dhabi, but you need privacy because you, if you have compliance, you'll have uh, DIDs and these things, but then you have personally identifiable information. You have to keep that private, except for the disclosure regime connected with those regulated assets. So privacy is a requirement of regulation. Regulation, you typically think, oh, I have no privacy. It's the other way around. Anytime you increase the amount of identity, you actually have to increase the amount of privacy for the system. It makes sense. Why give illegal migrants a social security number? It makes no sense. Um, it really doesn't. They are paying into the system when they get wages, usually through stolen identities. But uh, instead, you should have a guest worker program and a proper tax regime and identification regime. But that's just an artifact of the fact that people can't solve the problem, work together. Thoughts on the H-1B visa system. The whole fucking system is broken. The J-1 visas, the HBB ones everything is, uh, you know, the, about the only thing that works is the EB-5, the rich people visa. Uh, you know, so it's amazing how they create a dual system for everything. Yeah, this is actually a great point. You know, they pay taxes on wages they can't actually collect benefits from if they're not in the cash economy, which many are, and they're actually using a stolen social security or they have some form of identifier and they're paying taxes, uh, they get no benefits back. So actually they pay at the highest rate, which isn't not fair to them. Um, so that's why I guess worker program makes a lot of sense and redo the entire migration system. It's funny when you talk to somebody who is independent of the group think of the two parties in America and actually has opinions, you'll notice that it's hard to place them. Like Joe Rogan is a great example of that, where politically speaking, he has a lot of liberal ideas. Like he's in favor of universal health care and he loves the idea of free education and all these things. But then he has a lot of conservative ideas as well. And so it's just like impossible for people to fit him into a box. And a lot of the people on the left are like, he's an alt-right person. So a guy who believes in universal health care is alt-right and grew up in Hollywood. Is, is alt-right, really? And then alt-right sides are like, oh, yeah, he's with us on everything. And then Joe says some stuff and they're like, I don't understand. It's almost like uh, The Last of Us uh, where they had the survivalist and they uh, they had that episode about the guy who's like the hardcore survivalist. And that was like the ultimate mindfuck because uh, all these conservative guys were watching me like, that would be me in the apocalypse. A and then it uh, turns out he's gay. And then they're like, wait a minute. And all the GLVT people are like, oh, those goddamn gun-toting Republicans. Ah, we hate those guys. And then they, they find his gay. It's like, I, I don't know how to feel about this. It's, these are not compatible ideologies. What do we do? Um, and it's always fun when you see those types of things. And so kudos to the writers for that. That was one of the best episodes of that, uh, of that season, but it, uh, that's reality. That's people. Um, you are not a brand. You are not a product. You're a free thinking person. And if somebody attacks you for having your own ideas, your own beliefs, there's something wrong with them, not you. 
uh, you're, you know, it might be the kooky beliefs and not many people agree with them, but you, you aren't, you're not supposed to just be a brand. I, I support the current thing. That's the difference between an NPC and a PC. And, and so on the immigration side, um, there's a lot of good ideas that came out of the left on how to solve this issue. But there are some acknowledgments about structural deficiencies from the constitutional level on down. And there needs to be a serious conversation evaluation. You can't solve the problem unless you have a holistic solution. So you have to bring everything together and you have to acknowledge where people's incentives sit and why the problem exists. Uh, and, this, and some of the times it's deeply cynical where they just want the problem to exist because they can raise money on the problem or uh, because they know that if it doesn't get solved, eventually a crisis will form that they can benefit from and they gamble with people's lives. Meanwhile, everyday people, they just, they don't want to live and be preyed upon. Um, look at how much sex trafficking occurs and look at how much violence occurs for people who are in the United States illegally and how little representation uh, and sunlight that they get uh, as a result of that. If you're molested by a coyote, probably nothing will happen to that person. Uh, and that's a dark and terrible humanitarian crisis. And the option is just go stay in a, in a place where organized crime rules everything and everybody lives in fear. And the police chief just got shot in the back of the head and he is in, just buried in the desert. And that's, that's your alternative. What would you do if you lived in those circumstances? So, you know, you always have to divorce yourself from the group think and say, what's the human element of it? And if there is a human tragedy, how do we do better? And there's got to be a third option. There's got to be some blending of ideas or new ideas that enable you to solve it. And that's how you move forward in life. And if people try to hold you back, it's because they're scared that that solution will end the gravy train for them. Thoughts on the sound of freedom? Yeah, it is really interesting that Hollywood attacked a successful piece of IP, which is uh, based on a true story about child sex trafficking. You know, why do they hate that movie so much? Yeah, they're all friends with Epstein and Weinstein too, huh? Huh, I don't know about that, man. I really don't know about that. There's, there's more to that story. Yeah. <laughs> Status on the Ethiopia project saw so already commented. You're a hard man to figure out. Then that's the point y'all should be. Were you surprised that room temperature, ambient pressure, semiconductor, superconductor was fake? Not really. I mean, everybody was super skeptical about it. We were excited about it too. Uh, I mean, there's bad career implications when you publish a paper like that. So it sucks to be those guys, but yeah, uh, we were, you know, I, I was just a, cautious observer on the outside. Mm -hmm. thoughts on dc sparks projects and mina's progress that's called interoperability them working with other people's good for the ecosystem they learn from it and they bring those ideas back and with a members-based organization what you can do is they can have discussions about how we can grow and evolve from other people's ideas as opposed to pretending like we always have the best ideas internally What's your favorite bird, Charles? Used to have a toco toucan. Toucans. 
Love two cans. Reflect was easily one of the coolest projects. Excited to see how we can invest in that. Yeah, pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of nifty, interesting things that uh, they're doing. I like Les a lot, and there's a wonderful team there, Eric and Josh Miller and the others. And uh, it's going to be fun to watch that company grow up uh, next year. Do you own a manned drone yet? You know, great irony is I own a lot of stuff, but I, uh, well, actually I, I do own a, um, one drone. I bought a surveillance drone for 4k and LIDAR mapping and, uh, Don, uh, uses it over at the ranch for mapping the ranch. We map a few hundred acres at a time and get it done. But, um, I am, uh, I, I, I'm really excited about these drones that you can get in and fly. They're, they're kind of like semi-autonomous drones uh, where they, they use AI to help you fly them and you do like a low 30 to 50 feet. It's kind of like a hover bike. I'm really excited about those things. There's a few interesting companies like Jetson is one and others, but they're not quite where they need to be. They're all EV tolls. So the 15 minutes of flight time is like, guys, go to hydrogen. You have much higher energy density. You can do a lot more with that, like jet fuel. Were you a fan of Snoop Dogg before? You know, I always admired Snoop Dogg's business acumen. Uh, there's a few songs of his that I like, but I'm not a huge rap guy. But Snoop is one of the brightest businessmen in all of music. Uh, and all of entertainment. He's a brand machine. He understands intellectual property, understands partnerships. He knows how to run a company. He's insanely disciplined. I'll tell you a story. So I went down, saw him in Colorado Springs, and he was with Warren G and all the other guys. I gave Warren G some shit because he, he was kind of phoning it in at the, uh, at the uh, um, performance, although they retired, but Snoop did not. He, he was going all out. He was there. He's fired up. Now it's like negative 20 degrees down there, fucking cold as hell. He was just in Casper the day before, drove a bus down to Colorado Springs. And I saw him backstage and I said, what are you doing after this? It's like 10, 11 o'clock at night. He's like, got to do the after party. It's like, how the hell do you have the energy? It's just like, you've been going nonstop, man. And, and he's like, hey, you know, the fans want it. Uh, and so he went and actually was running the after party with T Pan and these other guys till like two o'clock in the morning. And he was DJing, pushing it through. You know, that's a work ethic. Every day that guy's hustling it. You know, every day he's really putting in the time, the effort. And uh, if there's a way to squeeze another 50, 100,000 out of an event or there's a way to, to find a new angle or a new business or something like that, he does it. Uh, that's a rare, rare acumen. The Rolling Stones have it. Um, you know, a few other of the, the mega guys like Metallica, they got it too. Uh, you know, we deal with them from time to time. Uh, and you just meet him and you say, wow, there is a real business mind that's, uh, that's behind the talent. And that's what makes the talent enduring because they can reinvent themselves to meet the times and they don't end up being a uh, one hit wonder and just kind of swept, uh, swept away. So I deeply admire that. And that's a super, super rare thing. The other thing that's very unique about Snoop Dogg, he's a double threat outside of being tremendously talented. He cares a lot about the next generation and he wants them to have a very different experience than the experience that he had growing up in the eighties and nineties and all the stuff that he had to go through uh, to become uh, where he, he's at. Uh, so he thinks a lot about how do we redo intellectual property? How do we build record labels that aren't predatory? How do we build relationships where they're productive and good partnerships? So the next Snoop Dogg doesn't have to go through what he went through. And that really means a lot too. Um, you don't have to do that. When you're a tier one guy with an empire, you could just ride on your laurels and coast and make boatloads of money and earn the royalties and these types of things. You don't have to wake up and say like, how do I do right by the next group of people? So there's a lot of love there and there's a lot of care there and there's a lot of compassion there that's under the hood. So he's a 
business machine, but he also actually is a compassionate business machine. That's a rare, rare person. And it uh, it's an honor to have spent some time with him. And uh, it's an honor to just watch him work. It's uh, it's pretty magic, really. And he's got a great crew, too. They're super loyal. Everybody in his circle, they've been around for a long time, and he's kind of carried them with him through the years. Uh, and that's another hallmark of a great leader is that they inspire love and loyalty in, uh, in the people around him. And yes, Warren G did phone it in that night. <laughs> spoken, a, spoken a joint on stage and just like, hey, everybody, <laughs> take a little break. <laughs> thoughts on weed you know people want to use it i have no problem with it i went to see you boulder guys 420 was a national holiday for our university um it's not my cup of tea but you know if people like it and they want to use it not a problem if it doesn't interfere with their relationships family or work um we in america are much too serious about these things uh, you know, Nixon declared the war on drugs and we weaponized uh, a whole movement and created strong financial incentives for vice squads to go after good people. Um, and yet we built a pharmaceutical industry that basically doesn't give a shit if you get addicted to their stuff and die. Look at the opioid crisis and how horrific that's been. Look at all the different substances that are legalized in the United States that are tremendously addicted. Tobacco is a great example. I smoke cigars and I fully recognize that when I smoke cigars from time to time, I am increasing my risk of cancer. I fully understand that. And I take that risk. Now I'm not addicted to cigars. If somebody came and said, you can never smoke a cigar again, I'd say, okay, that's fine. But here's the reality. A lot of people who smoke cigarettes are addicted and no matter how hard they try to quit, life pushes them back into it. Half a million Americans die every year because of that. Half a million, perfectly legal. And then we go and say, oh, God, marijuana is so terrible. Oh, we just, we just cannot allow that. It'll destroy and unravel society. I remember in Colorado when they talked about legalizing marijuana, Governor Ritter, uh, Governor... Uh, Bill Owens, and I believe, I think it was Hickenlooper as well, I, I have to check, all got together and they did this big announcement, oh, this is wrong, we can't do this, don't vote for this constitutional amendment. We had to do a fucking constitutional amendment because the legislature was so against it. And they said that all of society in Colorado is going to unravel. And did it happen? Has society in Colorado unraveled? Has everything gone to shit and we're all falling apart? No. We sometimes have to take our freedoms back because there's a group of people that get really, really comfortable with taking stuff away from us and then giving us a little bit back and saying, look at what I did for you. It's like when Biden is just saying, oh, well, we're going to move pot from schedule one to schedule three. It should be unscheduled. It's a weed. It grows in your backyard. Don't go love the man just because he beats you five times instead of 10 times. Maybe you should get in a different relationship where they never beat you. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just not okay. And uh, there's this is just a microcosm of a macro. I mean, psychedelics are another example of that. Just in California, Gavin Newsom vetoes the decriminalization of them with some bullshit reason. That's a uniparty, one-party control. The Democrats run everything in California. So you mean to tell me that when the legislature is going to pass a law they don't synchronize and talk with the governor before they pass to understand what his opinion is to see if he's going to veto or not. And if he has problems in the bill, they're not going to resolve that in a closed room. It's all political theater because at the end of the day, the people he works for, Big Pharma, basically told him we can't allow a substance to be legalized that can get people off of SSRIs, that can cure stuff that we make billions of dollars treating every year. Do everything in your power 
to keep it down. That's the reality. And it's bipartisan. The Republicans do it too, you know, because they work for the same people at the end of the day. And these things that either expand your mind or reduce your stress or other stuff or allow you to look at the world differently, those are the things they make illegal first, not because they're harmful. Certainly plenty of things to be harmful about it, but then there's proportionality. We're going to let you buy guns and we're going to let you smoke and we're going to let you work in uranium mines and let you work as a crab fisherman and offshore oil rigs and go to war, but then you're not capable of making a decision how to regulate a substance. Really? Really? That's that's what you're going to just tell all of us in 2023? We're just so stupid we can't handle that as people, but you're so smart you can. And we're just going to take our opiates and that'll that'll get us where we need to go all cuz it makes Pfizer money. You know, it's uh it's pretty sad uh, that we're here, but that's the consequence of corporatism and why we must get rid of it. This is a True statement right here. The U.S. is not, never has been, and never will be a Christian nation. True statement. The U.S., what made us special wasn't that we aspired to be a Christian nation. What made us special is we were a nation. You're free to be a Christian. That's the part you guys usually miss. The freedom of religion is a bedrock principle of the United States. And the founding fathers were deeply religious people. It would have been very easy to create a state church, just like the Church of England. They could have created the Church of the United States, and it would have probably gotten its way through because, like, everybody was a Christian. They all went. But they made us free to be a Christian in the United States. And freedom of religion is a foundational negative right that has to be enshrined and protected uh, wherever we go. And yet there's certainly a lot of Judeo-Christian principles that are in U.S. law and frankly, most of English common law, uh, and to make them unique or special, but there's some good ideas there, and we should never forget that as we talk about this. How do you feel about Ethgate and how Cardano is the solution to these types of problems? You know, what's the most interesting thing about Ethgate is we've always been talking about two separate things entirely, and there's never a reconciliation because there's never an acknowledgement that we're talking about two separate things. When they talk about Ethgate on the other side of the aisle, they're talking about, okay, people use connections and relationships and perhaps money to convince insiders in the government to go easy on Ethereum. Probably happened. Who knows? Hard to say. There's obviously a lot of people digging in that well. And it's like, does a bear shit in the woods? So you're telling me T-Mobile when it wants to buy Sprint, doesn't find ways to make the FCC and the FTC and others a little happier about that. That's how America does business. It's wrong. It shouldn't happen. But that's how that happens. And we're surprised that our own industry started learning that, that Joe Lubin figured some stuff out. Okay. I mean, uh, let's, let's be real about it. We're adults. We can have a real conversation. I know the media can't, and I know we're not supposed to say these things, but I, I always try to just keep it honest with you because I just don't give a shit anymore. That happens. And you know what? If you've discovered evidence of it, hopefully somebody somewhere can do something about it. So that's usually what they talk about with Ethgate. And then I said one thing, just one thing, grand conspiracy, which is the other thing. And that other thing is people from the Ethereum side bribed the Securities Exchange Commission, to go after XRP. These are very different things. It's one thing to use relationships to protect your own thing. It's another thing to use relationships in a conspiracy to attack a competitor. Now, the vast majority of people who talk Ethgate are over here, and that's what they're talking about. Very few are over here, and if they are, then I'd say, what evidence do you have of that? Where are the emails? Where are the meetings? All these other things. Like I could imagine some guys getting together, eating some steak and drinking some wine saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, maybe we should make Ethereum not a security. I can imagine that conversation happening. I don't understand how you have any evidence that the conversation was also, oh, and by the way, while you're at it, we're so scared of XRP, a system at the time that doesn't even have smart contracts, that has nothing to do with our business model and serves different customers. Can you say they're a security and go after them? Wouldn't the very act of weaponizing the SEC to do that create blowback that could potentially cause Ethereum to get hit? 
and impacted? Doesn't that expose all the stuff you're trying to do? Doesn't that dilute your entire goal of making Ethereum not a security to also do that? Are you so scared of XRP that's going to happen? Really? You re really believe that? Oh, if you do, you're a crazy person in my book. And that's when I say grand conspiracy, I'm talking just about that. I don't care about the other side of it because it's not surprising to me if it's true. If it's not true, okay. What's it have to do with the price of tea in China? And now for almost a year and a half, we've been talking about this. Seriously, we've been talking about this. It still comes up. And people on Twitter, anytime like the Ripple wins something against the SEC, they're like, do you believe us? No. We're not even talking about the same thing. You have yet once to give any evidence whatsoever that a single meeting has happened where somebody in the Ethereum circuits bribed or gave money or convinced a member of the SEC to go after XRP. Not once have you done that. If you go back to my statement, said, that's the grand conspiracy. I could have probably said it more eloquently, but it was just a lightning rod that, that got so integrated into the souls of these people. They can't let it go. And we talked at the beginning of this AMA about truth in constructed realities. And that is a great case study of it where they honestly believe I'm talking about both those things. And no matter how many times I pull them apart, they say, no, you were talking about both those things. And grand conspiracy also means the other thing that I don't even care about. And I don't want to, and there's nothing productive there. Really. And also the other thing is a litigation strategy going after Ethereum and their, their, their whole thing doesn't really make any sense. Why would you want to say if you're litigating that Ethereum did something improper to make itself not a security? Why wouldn't you want to say that the SEC is right, Ethereum is not a security, and then argue by analogy those same facts and circumstances apply to you to not be a security? It's actually an anti-benefit. If you think about it, really think it through. Like, Take a moment, do the logic on a piece of paper and ask yourself this. If the only reason they're not a security is because they bribe the regulator, well, then they are a security, which means those facts and circumstances hurt you in your litigation of saying you're a security or not. If they stand on their own merits as not a security, then you can use those merits as an analogous argument in your legal argument for you not being a security. You want that to be proper. So that's why I also never understood stirring the pot in this particular, I understand why the community does it because they feel it's unfair and they're unfairly targeted. Sure. But from a litigation strategy, it doesn't make any sense at all to me. And that was my other point about it. When you're litigating, you want to maximize the things that help your case and help you win. And you don't really care if you're a competitor, if one of your competitors got something and you can use that as evidence to help your case, you're going to take it. Your friends today, enemies tomorrow. That's how litigation works. So why then would you want to unravel the whole basis of the argument that they're not a security? Why would you stir that pot? That, does, that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Um, yeah, there's certainly value getting the emails, the Hinman emails and these other things because they perhaps expose the thought process that the SEC has. And you can definitely show there was unequal, unequal application of that. That's fine. But none of that activity presupposes corruption, just favoritism. You see, so I, I, I don't know, you know, it's just this, how the internet works and it, it can't be fixed now. It just can't be because what am I going to do? Just go grovel and go, oh, please take me back. Ah. Even you do that, they just smell weakness and attack you some more. And then I, I use reason and logic like I did right here. And they just go, neener, neener, neener. I can't hear anything. No, it's the same thing. It's like no one on that side is convinced with this rant right here. No one. And that's where we're at. Okay. You can, you can literally show the evidence. It's like shaggy. It wasn't me. <laughs> so it's a teachable moment. Don't make my mistakes. Um, you know, understand that things are sensitive. There's lightning rods. Things are very polarized. And in some cases you just have to agree to disagree and hopefully move on. And that's why I tweeted. I said, Hey, peace. 
you know, let's as a community come together. And I'm well more than willing to work with people um, from that side of the aisle, contradicting prior statements. I, I just so frustrated there. And it just is so crazy there. But, um, you know, I still like Brad. You know, I still like all the other guys. You know, uh, there's CTO David Schwartz. He's a great guy. They're good people. I hold Ada, but thinking to sell after hearing him now. What about that? <laughs> you can't win, kids. You can't win. <laughs> oh, man. Probably the best uh, CS book um, for people learning computer science is Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs. It's been rewritten multiple times and coming in through the LISP style approach, data-driven approach is a really good way of learning how to program. And again, this one here, it's like, what did I just say about that? I gave you a very specific use case and example, and then you you overgeneralize. Charles, I'm 400 pounds and have no skills. Can I live on your ranch as a buffalo? <laughs> you know what we do with those buffalo? <laughs> uh, I love Scala and functional programming. Scala 3 is one of my favorite languages. Man, I love it. Highly recommend it. Did you or did you not call XRP holders crazy when they mention FGate? I just explained exactly what I said with the grand conspiracy. And then when people linked them together and they wanted the overreaction, as you are doing literally right now, case to my point, uh, and I explained what happened. And I made multiple videos. It escalated, and escalated, and escalated. And now we're back. We're literally back here. We're, we're, we're right here again. You just proved every single thing I was just saying. You can't separate them. You just can't. I never once said your thoughts about Hinman or these other things, Ethgate, are a conspiracy. I said the notion that Ethereum bribed the SEC to go after XRP, there is no evidence for it. It's a conspiracy theory and it proves nothing. I also just said, Again, it's now for the 67th time. It is a shit litigation strategy to go ahead and say the only reason the SEC decided that Ethereum is not a security is because they were bribed and not by the facts and merits. Because if they were bribed, then the facts and merits would make both of them a security. Otherwise, you're showing unequal application of the law, which helps you in litigation. So that was my statement. And you've just shown the whole world, all 700 people listening right now, my point, you can't, you can't get past it. You just can't, man. It's, it's, it's in your bones. You can't escape. It's there. It's like, it's inside of you. It's, it's part of your soul and it's okay. Turn on Katy Perry's firefly of uh, fireworks and just watch it on a loop. You can show people your light, your fireworks. You can, you can, you can be there SBF. You, you can do this. You can. <laughs> oh, man. Changing position. 
How often do you meditate? Obviously not enough. <laughs> I have been to Gillette. It's a shithole. Well, that might be true, sir, but it's our shithole. And that's also the energy capital of Wyoming, by the way. We have enough coal in Gillette, Wyoming for a third of, uh, for, to power the entire United States, it was a third of all U.S. coal production, to power the entire United States if we wanted to for 300 years. You know that? That's the best coal. That coal in Gillette, oh, it's so sweet. It's so beautiful. So nice. Oh, my God. It just, it's like warm butter, guys, that coal. It's just, it's just tasty. Very tasty. They pushing your button, man. No, it's not the guy. That guy actually believes it. I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. He really does believe it. It's, it's, it's part of his soul. It's inside of him. Again, we're just going to have to watch fireworks. Katy Perry. We're Katy perry the shit. Do you play Diablo 4? Nobody plays Diablo 4. <laughs> they have like five users now. Somebody please make a clip montage of this AMA. Oh, there's a lot of good materials in this one. You guys got to do it. Did you ever meet the BTC miner in Gillette? Yeah, literally, guy lives uh the, their their facilities across the street from where we're doing our construction warehouse. I did have a call with him last week, uh, New York based guy, and I guess they got some Dubai backers. Uh, real cool dude. Do you have a ginkgo tree on your rancho? I do. It was a gift from Vassal. Your opinions on private versus public chains, I think they should all be public, uh, but I do believe that you can merge consensus together and have part of your consensus be a federated quorum. That's the point of uh, Midnight, but public is one out. R3 has learned that. Fabric has learned that. These other guys have learned that. Reminds me of Dave Chappelle when keeping it real goes wrong. <laughs> I miss Dave Chappelle. The Chappelle show was so good back in the day. I know you don't like patents for aging tech. Are you avoiding patents? You know, it'd be really nice to try to do something that's still in that uh, Lawrence Lessig uh, free culture uh, framework. And I, I'm going to try as much as I can to keep it philosophically there. There's a variety of reasons why you build a portfolio. So it's a little less clear in biotechnology than it is in software where it's black and white and it should be open sourced. That headline will mention your, quote, unhinged rant. <laughs> this is the media, too. Every time I tweet something, an AI-generated article comes out like 30 minutes later. Unhinged rant from Charles Hoskinson. Best city to live in Japan, Osaka. Kansai Jin, man. Do you play Baldur's Gate 2? Baldur's Gate 2 is one of the best games ever made. Do you like attorney John Deaton? I do. I'm sure he'll make a video about these things. <laughs> yeah, you notice. 
it's the backroom casting couch, huh? Huh? Yeah, this guy, he's, he's, he's paying attention. He noticed. The people who furnished the office bought that as a parody for me, and I didn't know for an entire year until somebody made a meme, and they sent me a picture. That person no longer works here. Will you be back in Capitol Hill soon? Yeah. I, I literally own a chocobo. Like I have a company making an actual chocobo. You're asking that question. Can't see the chocobo. It's like that uh, steamed hams thing with Skinner and Superintendent Chalmers. Aurora Bolialis, localized entirely in your kitchen this time of year, this place of the country. Yes. Uh, so my beard plan is uh, very much like uh, Castaway. I just let it grow and get shaggy. And at some point, people rescue me and they shave me. That's what we do. Shave your mustache and I can help you get laid with Amish women. <laughs> oh god you jumped the shark man jump the Amish shark ah oh, we're doing the lord's work Mikhail oh Oh man. <laughs> but they're not allowed to watch. <laughs> we got them. They can't use technology. They would be watching in sin. <laughs> but don't worry, a strongly worded newspaper will work its way on horseback to them. And they'll write a strongly worded letter back that you guys will read off to me. Oh, God. Uh. <laughs> oh, shit. Ah. Uh. Our saltwater battery is a no-brainer for energy storage. Maybe kind of, sort of. Who knows? Yes, no. Do you have a story for Avatar 3? No, I've never really. <laughs> this is great. This guy, I think they can watch on a Mennonite computer. They're going to form an alliance, the Mennonites and the Amish. Got to watch out for those guys. They got you. Can you talk a bit about Cardano's current relationship to academia and any involved programs? Uh, Stanford relationship, CMU relationship, the University of Wyoming relationship. There's dozens of these things across the world. You have to be more specific. How old are you? 35, if you believe the internets. It's a mechanical computer. Hey, kids, I'm a computer. Stop all the downloading. G.I. Joe. Are you vaccinated, Charles? Yeah, I got uh, two of the Pfizer shot, this arm right here. I still have pain in the injection site two years later. Didn't get any of the boosters. 
got COVID four times. Doesn't work. But don't worry, on your 27th booster, that's when they got it right. Nor the uh, myocarditis. They roped me into that. Have you asked ChatGPT to give you a computational definition of free will looking through the lens of cellular autonoma? No, free will is truly escaping the deterministic chains of, of these systems, then Gregory Shaitan is right. Um, you, you know, it's, you can just a whole concept called Omega for these types of things. It's an undecidable thing. You're not going to have in a large language model give you an appropriately computable, understandable, decidable definition of free will if it escapes that system. And if it's within the system, it's deterministic. You don't have free will. So different modalities. It's not going to give you anything, which is why Roger Penrose wrote Emperor's New Mind and stepped outside of that structure and said, you need a different unit of computation to be able to express what we do. You can't do it in a Van Neumann system. Sorry. Got to meet Roger one of these days. This is still going? Wow! Yes, I am. What's your favorite song? Right now, it's Hurt from Johnny Cash. <laughs> after that, after that Amish shit and the scrotal beard, there's no going back. We are, we're, we're just going crazy. I don't know what's going on. Hello, fellow Zillion player. This guy, this guy gets it. Zillion is the pass forward. You can't kill him in the Zillion. And he loves Eurodance. Charles, could you fund someone at the end of your AMA? like you used to at the end of the AMAs, uh, will be a nice treat for someone in the world at the moment. You know, that's actually a really good idea. Let's see if I have some uh, credit still with Kiva. Just a moment. Actually, we'll do this through John's company after everything all gets set up. That's actually the reason we created it is that I wanted Kiva on a blockchain. So let's go ahead and sign in real quick and let's see if my account is still there. Oh, we have 1800 bucks. How about that? All right, present a screen share. We're going to do a brave tab and uh, loans that change lives. All right. Wow. You guys should see that. All right. So this is my Kiva account and I have available to loan $1,018 and I've done about $2,000 in outstanding loans. So let's take a look at somebody in the world. So we're going to go lend by region. All right, there's North America, Central America, South America, Africa, Eastern Europe, Middle East, Asia, Oceania. So where should we go today? Let's do, let's see what's in the Middle East. Uh, Israel, Jordan, Palestine, Turkey. How about Jordan? Let's see what's floating around in Jordan. I was actually just in Jordan last year. I went to Wadi Rum. Let's see here. He's doing a tobacco store. Awesome. Wants to buy a better knife and more chickens for his butcher shop. She needs to buy supplies for her business. She wants to buy blankets to sell to make an income. Let's look into her story. Let's learn a little bit more about that. Okay. The world does need a little bit more love. She had to because her job doesn't pay enough. She's working in sewing factory. Instead of sitting there and complaining to the boss, she's decided that a business will be better and built a reputation for herself. This makes her blankets. Okay. Yeah, let's see here. So right here is the region. 
Okay. All right, let's do it. Let's uh, go ahead and give her lend now. And uh, let's see here. Continue to check out. And what we're going to do is stop the screen share for the checkout process. And what we're going to do is complete her loan. So I need to give her a little bit more. There we go, the 725. Give a credit, all that stuff. Complete order. Okay. Nope, continue to my portfolio. And there we go. So share screen. And we'll go back to yes. Now let's take a look at how the portfolio is going. I've lended a total amount of $15,000. And now she's completely funded. So, and then these are the other people that I have in the portfolio. You can take a look at the entire portfolio. How about that, huh? Yeah. And that's why we do what we do. You know, um, I hope we can do all this on a blockchain one day, you know, to return to something a little bit serious. Um, it's not a lot of money for me, but it means the world for her. And if we can create a situation where all those middlemen get stripped out, because she's not going to just repay uh, what I put in. There's middlemen that have to be paid. And it sometimes is a 35 to 85 percent interest. Uh, and, you know, if we can strip them out, then everybody would just do it because it makes a little money on the side and billions of dollars of capital will go. And I really do hope that uh, she actually is successful and builds a great business and she's able to sell a lot of blankets and able to take care of her kids and family. And we'll find out. And they do pay those loans back. I've lent $15,000 so far and about $1,300, 13,000 has been, uh, has been uh, repaid. So on average, if you have the right networks and the right people and you vet the right loans, the repayment rates are pretty good. Uh, and that's actually what John's exploring with the whole real FICO and trying to bring that to the blockchain space. So we never lost Kiva. And thank you for reminding me that that's pretty cool. And uh, you know, remind me a year from now, I'll go and check and see where that loan's at. And, also, it'd be really cool if I'm ever in Jordan to see if, how her business is. All right. I'm going to go get some lunch and uh, and call it. Thank you all for participating. This has been a wild one. We've had a lot of fun. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. Uh, we laughed. We cried. We learned about the Amish. We talked about XRP. <laughs> the Internet's certainly going to have a lot of fun with this, uh, and that's okay. It's good to be back, and it's good to talk to everybody.